talked about the difference between electric force, electric field, and potential difference or electric potential. Um, we're going to turn our attention to the flow of charge and we're going to study circuits. So our next series of lectures 13.1, 13.2, and 13.3 are going to focus on our introduction to circuits. So we've talked about potential difference or voltage. Oops, difference, oops. <laughs> I cannot spell. Um, and we've talked about the fact that uh, whenever you have charged objects, that those charged objects have this imaginary force field or electric field around them. And when you have a positive and a negative charge um, that resides on two parallel plates, that the electric field between them is constant and it points from positive to negative. And we talked about the fact that, you know, when you try to move a charge in that field, it's going to gain energy in one form or another. So if it moves in the direction of the field line, it will lose potential energy, but will gain kinetic energy. And we can get an idea of how many joules per coulomb or um, a charge will gain by calculating the potential at any point and then so and then evaluating the difference between two different points, which we call the potential difference. So in order to make charge flow, there has to be a potential difference between the two points. If the voltage is the same, then there's not going to be a loss of any kind of energy or a gain of any kind of energy. So in order for the, the charge to actually flow, you have to have some kind of potential difference. And the way we do that in a circuit is by um, providing some kind of voltage source like a power supply or a battery. So once we have that in place and we connect wires to either side of the ter positive and negative terminals of that battery, then that sets up the conditions for charge to be to start flowing. So voltage is essential. We have to have some kind of potential difference in the circuit or voltage to cause the electrons to start to flow. And that flow of charge is called the current. It's measured in amps. And an amp is the number of coulombs per second. So for example, if I knew that there were 590 coulombs of charge passing through a flashlight in 0 0.450 hours, I could figure out the current. It's charge divided by time. And the time is in seconds. So I know that the time here is 0.450 hours, and one hour has 3,600 seconds. So 0.45 times 3,600 is 1,620 seconds. So if I have 590 coulombs passing a given point in 16 and 20 seconds, then the current would be divided by 1620 would be 0.364 amps. Amps, or sometimes this is written using engineering notation, 364 milliamps. Um, most of the times the current in circuits is very small. Um, one, you know, Coulomb per second would be a lot of amps. And in that circuit, because the circuit is connected by wires and has um, you know, materials or elements in it like resistors or capacitors, etc., those materials have an internal resistance to them. And that resistance is a resistance to the flow of electrons, and it's really um, due to the atomic structure of the material. And so resistance is um, measured in ohms, and the symbol for resistance is the Greek letter omega. It looks like an upside down or like a horseshoe. So um, the higher 
the resistance in that circuit, the less the electrons can flow through it. And resistance itself, the, the uh, resistance R is related to the resistivity, which is a property of the material, and it's directly related to the length of the material and inversely related to the area. So the longer the length, the more resistance, but the bigger the cross-sectional area, the less the resistance. So if you have a really long fat wire versus a really long skinny wire, it makes sense that the bigger A is going to have less resistance for that given length, right? Because um, it's almost like a water pipe if you think about it. It's easier for the electrons to flow through it because there's more area for them to flow through. So let's, so we've got voltage, current, and resistance. Voltage, the symbol for voltage is V. Symbol for current is I. And the symbol for resistance is R. And we measure our voltage in volts. We measure our current in amps. And we measure our resistance in ohms, which looks like that. And if you think about um, a circuit um, and you use the analogy of a water um, pipe, the voltage is the water pressure, the current is the flow of the water, and the resistance is the narrowness. So think about uh, if you've ever played with a uh, a water hose. If you put your finger at the end of the hose, it causes the uh, water to flow and have more pressure in it. Um, and that's because it increases the rate of flow because the smaller it is, um, the smaller that opening is, the more it flows out, the faster it flows out. So that's kind of what we were talking about before with the cross-sectional area. Um, it's the inverse relationship between those two. Ohm's law says that for a given device, so let's say you have um, a resistor, some little piece of material. This is a, like a little resistor here. And you connect it to um, a battery that has a positive and negative terminal. So you have a voltage across the battery and that's gonna cause the current to flow in it and then that internal material of that resistor, if that resistor, the resistance stays the same, no matter how much voltage you apply to it, then we say that that device follows Ohm's law. So um, if I say provide six volts to it in two amps volt, flows, and if I provide 12 volts to it and 4 amps flow, and if I provide um, um, 18 volts and 6 amps full, uh, flow in that device, then this is an ohmic device. That means that there's a direct relationship between the current and the um, applied voltage. So if I make a a graph of current versus voltage. Um, let's see how that would, what, what is that? Well, that means that the slope will be linear, okay? This will be a linear line because R is constant. So if the device follows Ohm's law, R is always constant, which means that there's a direct relationship between current and voltage. Now, let's rearrange Ohm's law here for I. I equals V all over R, or it equals, and we're going to pull out the R because it's a constant value, 1 over R times V. So our in our equation here for our generic equation for a line, which is Y equals MX plus B, B is 0 because when there's no current, there's no voltage. Y is on the is is our current, X is our voltage, and so that means that the slope would be one over R. So, for example, 
if we had a graph of current versus voltage and the slope was 0 0.10, then that would mean that the slope is equal to 1 over R and 0 0.10 ohms to the negative 1, that would be the um, ohms to the negative 1, or amps all over volts, that would be equal to 1 over R, so we take the inverse of everything, R would be equal to 1 over 0 0.10, which would give us um, 10 ohms. And so that means that that device is an ohmic device. So some devices are not ohmic and as they heat up their resistance changes. And a great example of that is a uh, incandescent light bulb, the old timey light bulbs. They have a little tungsten filament in them and as it gets hotter it gets brighter because the resistance um, decreases. So as you graph that uh, current versus voltage for that, you would find that it is not linear. And if it's not linear, then that means that it doesn't follow that device, doesn't follow Ohm's law, and you can't use Ohm's law to calculate things like the current in it or the resistance of it or the voltage of it given the other two parameters.